Okay, very good. Okay, well, uh, I really want to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Uh, and Andre said I should talk about this, so I, that's what I decided to talk about. Uh, so actually, perhaps I want to talk about too many things because we've been working on this kind of problem for the last four or five years. Uh, so I don't know how much we can cover, but let me try to do my best. Uh, largely, this work was done by two graduate students who have since fled the coop. Uh, Tamagna is working with Jorg, and Nish is at Columbia. Uh, so I guess one of the questions that a lot of us think about is how high can TC be? And if you look at a graph like this, and if you talk to some astrophysics friends, the answer is it can be as high as you want. There's certainly no bounds on TC in Kelvin. But perhaps I think uh, all scales in this problem are very high. So it might be useful uh, to make a Uemura plot, uh, which was made very early on in the high TC days by Tomo. Uh, but here I take a picture from uh, Pablo's group. So this is a log log plot. You can hide a lot of sins there. It's even hard to define necessarily what the Fermi energy is for a correlated or multiband superconductors. Uh, there isn't a desert. You can fill this up with a lot of BCS materials, but it is a fact. Uh, that we know very few materials, if any, which are up here. And I'll actually say, have more to say about that. So this seems to suggest that there might actually be a limit on TC. And in fact, the materials that come closest to uh, any putative bound share very little with each other. Magic angle crystal bilayer, graphene monolayer, iron, uh, selenide, and STO. And two ultra cold atoms, which are scaled by 10 to the 8, they're down there, but uh, nevertheless, they're on this line. So in some sense, the bound cannot depend on any mechanism and must be applying to any superconductor or paired superfluid. And I want to stress straight away that in general, we have succeeded in proving something in 2D and it's not expressed in terms of the Fermi energy, but it will give some insight into the story. And then in the second part of the talk, I'm gonna tell you about why we have not succeeded in proving anything in three dimensions, even though many of these materials are indeed bulk superconductors. So what determines TC? I hardly need to tell this audience. Uh, this is BCS theory, and there you feel that if you have higher densities of states, man have singularity, stronger attraction, if, if nothing else happens, uh, TC can be raised through the roof. Okay. And, and maybe in some of these hydrides, you are raising it through the roof using this, uh, this mechanism. However, actually it turns out that there is another way in which you can kill superconductivity. And that's not by killing the amplitude of the order parameter, but rather by randomizing the phase. And there's a long history of very distinguished papers uh, which suggested this. So since the superfluid stiffness plays a very major role in what I have to say, uh, I just put this up again. This audience doesn't need this uh, pedagogical description. The only thing I would say is uh, that the, for a parabolic dispersion, the stiffness can be separated into a numerator and a denominator which is the superfluid density in the mass, but more generally, it's only this combination which enters all physical observables like the London penetration depth or the weight of the delta function. Okay, so I am going to focus on low energy effective Hamiltonians. Uh, so I'm gonna throw away all the completely filled bands, a core electron, throw away all the unfilled things and focus on however many bands there are in the system which are actively involved in superconductivity, and I'll tolerate a completely general dispersion for them. I'm also going to, since I don't want to commit myself to mechanisms, really take an arbitrary interaction energy, but of course you can say you'll never be able to make any success with that. So I'm gonna make a key assumption. I want to compute the stiffness, uh, which is the response to a vector potential. So I'm gonna assume for now in the first part of the talk that the vector potential couples only to the kinetic energy and not to the interaction. In the continuum, this is obvious. In a lattice, you would do this using the pile substitution. Now, is this true? It's certainly true for a very broad class of uh, models that we study, uh, various electron phonon models, Hubbard models, TJ models, any density density spin spin interaction. It's also true for ultra cold Fermi gases. But surely we can write down models where this is not true. And there's one class of models where this is not true, which is very important in recent times. And those are flat bands. If you have flat bands, you have no kinetic energy. If you don't have a kinetic energy, you can't couple your vector potential to that. 
Let's set this aside temporarily. I will have something to say about flat bands as well. Okay, so let's first find an upper bound in the superfluid stiffness. And so we'll use linear response uh, to the vector potential. And uh, well, I'm really delighted uh, that Doug Scalapino is in the audience. And actually I'm equally delighted I see Jim Langer is also in the audience. So uh, these are giants in our field. Uh, and uh, it's an honor to have them in the audience. Okay, in any case, we can write down uh, the Kubo formula, which has a diamagnetic piece and a paramagnetic current current correlator. You can just do a Lehmann representation and just show that the second term has to be positive definite. So that means the superfluid stiffness pointwise in temperature is upper bounded by uh, the diamagnetic piece. Uh, what does the diamagnetic piece mean? Well, you can compute it uh, as the second derivative of your effective Hamiltonian, but it has also a very uh, physical meaning that's actually directly related to the optical spectral weight of the active bands. So the bands that I have chosen, I, so I've put the limits here, so I can write zero to infinity, but infinity actually means that I'm just computing the spectral weight of those bands. Okay, and now what is this object for, uh, 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 arbitrary interacting multiband system. And the answer is, you know, uh, for just parabolic bands, it was density divided by mass. Now the mass is some mass matrix in band space and the density is some density matrix. The nice thing about this is it may look complicated, but it's a rather simple object. This inverse mass tensor depends only on the band structure. By the way, it's only for say nearest neighbor in hopping on a square lattice that this is the kinetic energy. Otherwise it is whatever it is, okay? And this actually depends not just on the dispersion but even on the wave functions and that's also going to be quite important for many of the things I have to say later on. But what this does is separate out the band structure contribution coming into the mass matrix and the many body uh, physics which comes into this density matrix. Okay, so what are we going to do with this? Well, up till now, whatever I said was true in any dimensions, but now I'm going to uh, stand on the shoulder of these giants, uh, Berezinsky, Kostelitz, and Paulus. And uh, uh, as we uh, know from uh, very old work, that actually there's a jump discontinuity in the superfluid stiffness at the kostelitz paulus transition. And the costless Taulis TC is just related to the value of Ds just below TC. And this pi over two is universal independent of all microscopic physics, okay? And so uh, we have TC, which is related to the superfluid stiffness. We have an upper bound on TC. And so we have an upper bound on TC uh, from here, okay? So, uh, it doesn't, it's not immediately obvious since TC appears on both sides of this equation that's going to be useful, but at least uh, it's exact, it's independent of pairing strength and mechanism, uh, so long as you have a BKT transition in uh, two dimensions. So as I will try to show you, it's very useful when you have low densities and narrow bands and strongly correlated systems where BCS mean field theory fails. Conversely, when BCS mean field theory works, it works, this is an exact result, it's still valid, but totally useless. Okay, so let's first look at a spherical cow, uh, a parabolic band in two dimensions, and I'll give you any interaction you want that leads to pairing and superconductivity. And you get a very simple result, which for some reason had escaped attention for decades, that no matter what you do, you can never actually exceed one eighth epsilon Fermi. Uh, now, if you were to plot this, you get the red line, and it would be very unfair to declare victory and say that you'll never cross this red line because very few of these materials actually have parabolic bands. But nevertheless, uh, like the Judah model, a spherical cow gives you at least some feeling for what can or cannot happen, okay? And then we'll discuss what happens when you go away from simple parabolic bands. Yes. This is strictly in two dimensions. We, I have said that multiple times. I have said that multiple times, and I'll come back to why we don't succeed in three dimensions. Yes, Shankar. 
Okay, but let's first ask, can the parabolic band result be tested? So I had expected that it would be tested in cold atoms, uh, where actually I think that in the middle of the BCS-BEC crossover, there is a very good chance that we'll come very close to saturating this bound. And I'm not going into the details of why I think we will be close to saturating the bound there. Happy to discuss it with anyone who wants to discuss it. But what surprised me was that it actually got tested in quantum materials. So there's this very beautiful work by the Iwasa group at the University of Tokyo. They looked at the seemingly very complicated material, lithium dot zirconium nitrochloride. Uh, now this has a parabolic dispersion, band theory tells you that. It has a constant density of states, it's very two-dimensional. And you can't really tune the interaction as you do using Feshbach resonances in cold atoms, so you might think, how can you ever get BCS-BC crossover here? But the beauty of what the Iwasa group did was they gate controlled the system. So they, all you have to change is delta or epsilon Fermi. You can't control delta in this slightly doped system change epsilon Fermi. Okay. And they change the uh, density uh, over two orders of magnitude in this two dimensional material. And when they did that, they came and just came and sat on top of uh, this predicted bound. Okay. And there's a lot of other beautiful experiments that they did that you should definitely look at these papers. So now let's move to non-parabolic dispersions. Uh, so here uh, I do some quantum Monte Carlo uh, from people who learned it from Doug. Uh, this is sign problem free. Uh, and what you can see is that mean field theory will give you this BCS result. This is the attractive Hubbard model in a two-dimensional square lattice. And that, of course, goes through the roof because as you go towards this very strong coupling regime, the gap actually becomes extremely large. But TC at strong coupling has nothing to do with the gap. Now, I should point out that most places where I have talked about bounds, they are rigorous bounds, but here I put an aesthetics because I could give you a doping independent rigorous bound but actually I have given you an approximate estimate of our exact bound by putting in a momentum distribution which gives us even insight into how TC falls in the strong coupling regime. So what this tells us is that in some sense, if you couldn't do quantum Monte Carlo, you might do mean field theory and use the bound and say that the answer must lie below it, okay? So, and also this shows you that the bound is really hopeless in the BCS regime, uh, as you probably already guessed. Okay, you can play this game for materials uh, for which we really do not know what the pairing interaction is, uh, but you, the, since this bound is agnostic about mechanism, we can just do k dot p perturbation theory, fit the uh, values using the work of previous uh, authors, fit the data to ZX's RPES, and just simply compute the bound and give you numbers that, uh, you know, the TC for this band structure can never be uh, larger than 164. I think uh, there are reports all the way to 109, but most reports are closer to the 60 Kelvin regime. Okay, now what would you do if you have a honest to goodness um, complicated multi-band system? Because you have this, you can get this from band structure, but in general, you have no idea what to do with that. So you can play some mathematical physics games. You just use some standard inequalities, introduce a inner product in the space of operators, use cauchy schwartz and just finally say, okay, this density matrix is bounded above by uh, momentum distributions. The momentum distribution of Fermi system can never be more than one. And you can produce rigorous bounds that just depend upon uh, the band structure and nothing else, but you are degrading the bound by the series of inequalities. So if we play, and this could be very unjustified, this game for magic angle twisted bilayer graphene using, say, the Koshino Fu tight binding fit to Bistrisker and McDonald, we would get a rigorous bound of 48 Kelvin, and if we make some approximation, 6 Kelvin. Why am I, uh, I think you heard Debanjan's talk, uh, why am I saying that this may not be a reasonable thing to do? Because the assumption of interactions that do not couple to the vector potential may be highly questionable when you project into this very flat band. But let's come to flat bands in a second. Shankar, answer to your question. If all this works so nicely in, three dim in two dimensions, why not three, you know? Uh, the data suggests that there may be a bound. 
And in fact, there are experiments in cold atoms which suggest uh, that just to the BEC side of unitarity, the maximum PC is 22% uh, of uh, the Fermi temperature. Uh, but we don't know how to get this number except from experiment of quantum Monte Carlo. And the challenges are threefold. First of all, a lot of people mistakenly believe that the non-interacting BEC temperature is an upper bound in three dimensions. This is not true as shown by uh, protégés of Elliot Lieb. Uh, they say that, uh, the show actually, that repulsive interactions enhance the TC of a dilute Bose gas. This problem is also has a very long history. Given that Bogliobau solved the low temperature physics in the 1940s, we had to wait for a few decades. This was, this was settled. Uh, the second thing is, if you look at thermal phase fluctuations, which is what we were doing, then two dimensions is very special in that uh, the stiffness has the same dimensions as the free energy, uh, and therefore the temperature, okay, BTC. Here, not so. You need to include a ultraviolet cutoff. And then the question is, given an ultraviolet cutoff, can we produce a bound on this non-universal alpha? And this is not known. And the final problem is quantum phase fluctuation. So of course, we are all interested in how high TC can be. But if you want to prove a general bound, it should work even when TC is pushed down to zero near a quantum critical point. And near quantum critical point, you can do quantum Josephson scaling and show that this linear scaling between TC and DS must fail in three dimensions. And this is not just a matter of scaling. You can even show this from data. And there's a series of works, both in underdoped and overdoped cube rates, that TC actually stays like square root of DS. OK. So now let me turn to how much time do I have? Three minutes left. OK. Um, good. Probably we can't do very much in three minutes. Uh, but maybe like all the other speakers, I can also just uh, ignore the, no, just kidding. Uh, so uh, what is my motivation? So there's very, been very important progress on mean field theory, uh, which suggests that these flat pan systems, but now we are restricted to very simple and interactions, attractive Hubbard models on flat pans, have some very curious properties. And the stiffness actually depends on what is called the quantum metric for the Fubini's 2D metric, which tells you about the distance in uh, Hilbert space between nearby states. Uh, the question is, can we trust mean field theory in a situation where interactions are much larger than the bandwidth, which is actually zero for these flat man systems? And can we find exact bounds? And not what a lot of people are talking about, which are just mean field lower bounds, which just use some standard in inequality, uh, talking about the trace to quantum metric, upper bounding the churn number. That, that if, you, if you assume mean field theory, then of course you can get a lower bound, but that's not the point. The point is to understand something outside of mean field theory. Okay, so, uh, so what are the problems? Maybe at least I can tell you the challenges rather than the answers. So first of all, if you use the multi-band bound that I've been talking about, it's not optimal because the multi-band bound is up here, whereas the superfluid stiffness is down there. If we project to the flat band, as I already said, we cannot couple to uh, the vector potential. And if you have a topological flat band, there is an additional problem that you have to face because you have an obstruction to finding exponentially localized Vanier functions. So at least for flat bands with attractive Hubbard models, uh, we have uh, made progress by projecting onto the flat band, deriving a low energy effective Hamiltonian, and even for topological flat bands, finding an upper bound on the stiffness. And this is work in this paper. Uh, so here is the Lieb lattice. And I'm just going very, very fast through this. But we have an upper bound. Uh, OK, so the structure of the upper bound is worth talking about. The lower bound is very, very special and rests on some results of Lieb's. But the upper bound is quite intuitive. Uh, so the only energy scale in the problem is the interaction uh, when you're in the flat band and uh, all the other bands can be gotten rid of. So since this has units of energy, it must have the interaction, OK? Finally, how does it depend on density? Well, so if you completely fill the flat band or make it completely empty, the answer must go to 0. And that's why we get this uh, minimum of n and 2 minus n. And this omega is the spread of the Vanier functions when you project down into the flat band. And this 
you might say, well, why can't I make the Vanier function as scrunched up as I want and reduce this? The answer is the trace of the quantum metric prevents you from doing that, okay? So uh, that's, that's the bound and we can uh, connect it with I mean field theory. The one thing I want to say immediately is here you would say epsilon Fermi is zero, so TC over epsilon Fermi is infinity, but we get a finite TC bound. Okay. So uh, good uh, topological bands. Okay, I, I don't have any time to tell you uh, what to do or how we can compare with uh, quantum Monte Carlo, people who are in the audience, Erez and Demanjan. Uh, I was going to tell you about some recent experiments which have some bearing upon this, but I think I've just simply run out of time. Uh, so this is magic angle twisted by the graphene. Uh, here you can see that the measured KFC, where C is the correlation length, is extraordinarily tiny, uh, numbers going of the order one, okay? And you can see what the TC over epsilon Fermi ratio is, and it can be very large, much greater than one because you have both flatmans and Dirac dispersions. I'm happy to explain why that would be. Uh, we also figured out a way of estimating uh, the superfluid stiffness, which should be of some interest to experiment. This is just an estimate, because standard methods like two coil mu SR microwaves don't work. And then let me just end. Thank you very much. Very nice talk, and you managed to cover a lot. I'm very impressed. Okay, so I have two related questions. Uh, I have no problem with the bound, but as you said, it is not always very useful. No. When the bound, but the bound, I think. So the calc you are talking about mean field versus non-mean field in terms of interaction. You know, I'm very old-fashioned. I don't think that way. I think in terms of the coherence length yes. and the average particle separation, the connection between these two is not always obvious. So okay. in, in so, many of the examples, yeah. it, it can be made much more obvious okay. if I had more So, time. But you mean the connection still the way I think about it, but that boils yeah. down to that. I just want yeah. to make sure that that's what but it is. But actually, okay. it's... Mm -hmm quite common that strongly interacting systems have very small yeah, it's quite, pairs. quite common on a hand waving level it's fine but it mean happens field, okay now you had an example of quantum monte carlo calculation to show that the bound is obeyed for this material that was an attractive U hubbard model calculation yes. right so that's kind of a toy model i mean they're yes. super so uh, the point is suppose you took a more realistic model and did eliasberg theory assuming that yes uh, that it applies, I know having done it that the TC does not keep on going up, up, up as you increase coupling. It goes up and then starts coming down. So when you said TC will keep going up in mean field theory, you are thinking simple BCS, just so exponents. For instance, yeah. but, take a very, uh, very concrete problem. Let's take a uh, Fermi gas yes. uh, with Kashwak resonance. Mm -hmm. There is no Eliashwak theory you right. can do there. And there, if you do any mean field mm -hmm. theory, TC will keep going up because sure. the gap actually does go up. Yep. Yep. So that's what you have in mind. Okay. Now, for that system, does attractive U Hubbard model have relevance? This is not connected to the talk. I'm just very interested uh, since I didn't so know about the So for that material. system, actually, that's a continuum problem. Mm -hmm. And the attractive U Hubbard model, as such, is not directly relevant. They also have optical lattice versions. Uh, there, it's okay. And there. Yeah. Depending on the sign so, of view which they can tune, so, it may. may so, develop. what do these experimentalists think? Do they think it's electron phonon interaction, or what? What is where? their that material where they saw TC? Nobody oh, knows. Nobody knows. It's just an observation. I'm Mohit. I, I was just curious to know um, if you take a system that has no bands, like a quasi crystal. Yes. They see superconductivity in this. Yes. Is there a way of uh, thinking in terms of bounds without referring to uh, the bands itself? Or you don't need a bands in the end, you just need a tight binding model and you don't, and density of states is good enough? Okay. Uh, I haven't done the calculation. Uh, would love to talk to you about sure. it. But I think we can probably do something along those lines. We can certainly put disorder in the problem, so I don't think translational invariance is okay. uh, necessary ingredient to what we did. 
Exactly. Yes. Yes. Here? Uh, yes. Very simple question going back to your 2D part. Yes. Uh, white bands. So, as soon as we go away from uh, parabolic bands, do you have any feeling or can you give me an, an idea how to make the bound higher? What kind of modification from parabolic towards, let's say, Dirac or you need some next nearest neighbor hopping? What is Okay, what is so higher? Dirac actually, this bound is not useful. And here is the point, it's worth making, it's not, I'm not selling something, so I should tell you when it doesn't work. Because let, let, let me be at charge neutrality, and as uh, you all know, Andre and all have worked on it, uh, uh, if you turn on a sufficiently strong coupling, the system will go superconducting, you're at charge neutrality, okay. But the thing is, the optical spectral weight now must also know about transitions from the field uh, lower part to the upper part, so you'll get a very large bound. So for Dirac systems, this is not a particularly good or useful bound. Uh, unless you get into some very strong coupling regime, right. maybe but, it could be useful. But in general, uh, if I want to go away from a, um, a parabolic band, yeah. what will help to make the bound higher and still reasonable? Okay, we can discuss that. I think what you want to do is two things. It's not enough to make the superfluid density high. You actually also want to make the pairing scale high because otherwise the pairing scale will kill you. So you want to actually, so that's why you saw, and maybe I didn't get a chance to emphasize it, but both in the attractive Hubbard model and even in the flat plan cases, it's always in some intermediate coupling regime that TC is very high. In both very weak coupling and very strong coupling, it, it tends to become small. So you need to do both those things. So you need strong attraction and a large superfluid density. And that's kind of hard to, uh, I don't know if I have some chemistry way of uh, telling you, the, here's what uh, you should do in your lab. And, uh, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, since nobody asked, let me ask a quick question. Yeah. About same two-dimensional case, but now parabolic band. Yes. You show this nice set of data which almost reach the yes. limit. Do they see preformed pairs above TC in this situation? They have evidence for pseudo gaps. Uh -huh. So they have data, yes, uh, you should yeah. see, mm -hmm. yes. Thanks. But not a lot of experiments have been done on that system. It's in a little device and very few people can make that sample, mm -hmm. but they have done. So well, they can learn a lot. Okay. Oh, I know Chandravar. Okay. Again, uh, in your discussion, uh, you ignored the paramagnetic theorem. Can you say something about it? So uh, I ignored the paramagnetic term simply because I, then that would require me to do a full-blown calculation, knowing everything about the interactions. So it's a very, it's a crude thing I have done. But the advantage is uh, it allows me to get very general results. Of course, if you can calculate the paramagnetic term, you should calculate the paramagnetic term and see how much it uh, changes things. Okay, so I think we're done. session, and we reconvene at what? 4 or 4.15? 4.15. 4 .15.